Right. Um, hello. This is a talk about Git. Um, specifically, seven niche Git fixtures in fourteen minutes. Um, when I say niche, I don't. I don't also say useful, um, and, and that's very deliberate. Some of these I can only find very contrived uses for, although some of them are a lot more useful, and I think everyone should be using them. Um, uh, I'm going to assume like people know a bit about Git because I don't have time in 14 minutes to explain things about Git that, that I need to explain to get some of the, the concepts across. Uh, I want to give an overview of some of these. I can't go too much into detail because I have to do seven of them in 14 minutes. Um, and I, I've actually ordered them in the talk from the least useful to the most useful. Uh, so we can get some of the slightly more uh, nonsense ones out of the way first, and we can end on some on some ones that I think everyone should be using. Um, and, and the theme of this talk is that Git is great software, and you should try to use as much of it as possible. It lets you do some really, really cool things, and I want to show you what some of those are. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to get into the first one. And the first one, um, we're starting off with something that I find unpronounceable. Um, Git re -ra -ra. Git re -ra -ra. And I'm I'm not I'm not going to look up how to pronounce that. I'm just going to say Git re um because it stands for reuse recorded resolution. Um, I I prefer tools honestly to not be named by Scooby Doo, but there we go. Um, the the crux of this is that Git can remember how you resolve merge conflicts. So merge conflicts uh, most people find are extremely annoying. Um, you have to go through them normally manually or or, or with a, a diff editor or something like that. Um, and so if you have a situation where you need to resolve exactly the same merge conflict multiple times, then you can do that automatically with git re uh, It does not rhyme with Yosemite. I'm looking at the chat. <laughs> um, this isn't useless, but this really, really is of limited use. And you can turn it on in git config uh, with the thing that's on screen there. Okay, so say we have this Haskell file, um, hello world.hs. It just contains those two lines. Um, and, and we have two different branches where we're going to change what we say uh, out to the user. This is just a classic merge conflict, right? Um, so one branch, uh, we're going to change it to higher, and on the other branch, we're going to change the object of the sentence to Steve. Um, and we want to merge these two branches together. We're going to get a merge conflict. Um, after we fix the merge conflict, and we've got git re -re -re enabled, it will we'll have this line here that says recorded pre-image for hello world.hs. So git has sort of recorded what the merge conflict looks like beforehand. Uh, and if we type git re -re -re status, it shows us all the pre-images that it's considering at the moment. Um, so let's say we fix this merge conflict, and we uh, we type git re -re -re diff. This will actually show us what git re -re -re has seen in the merge conflict um, and how it's uh, seen that we've resolved it, and it will remember this. So let's say we commit that, but then we reset to the commit before we did this merge. Um, so we git reset hard, and then we try to merge in the branch again. Uh, it will do it for us. It will say resolved hello world.hs using previous resolution. So this is handy. This is the sort of thing we want. Um, and if you, indeed, if you look at hello world.hs, all both changes have been applied. Uh, you, it won't automatically perform the merge, but it'll automatically fix the conflicts. Uh, you have to stage it again and commit, and then it'll do the merge for you. Um, so a, a common use for this is say you've got a topic branch that's really, really um, that's gone on for a really, really long time, and you want to practice merging bits of it in. This is quite a nice use case. So if you think there are going to be a lot of merge conflicts, you can do some of them earlier, and then Git re will just remember how you do them later. You don't actually have to go through with a merge for Git re to remember it, so that's that's quite useful. Right, uh, I've already, I'm have already i already behind, so number two. Uh, we have got submodules. Submodules are quite useful, but in a, in a, in a limited sense. Um, so they let you keep a Git repo as a subdirectory inside another one. Um, and it's, this is especially useful for libraries and languages without package managers or code that you need somehow. So if you type git submodule add and then a link to a repo, it will add the links of the subdirectory um, in a folder in your current directory. Um, it will also give you a new file called .git modules, uh, which, which just contains this sort of information. Um, it says what the, the um, submodule is called, it gives you the path, and it gives you the URL, and you can just edit any of those and git will automatically fix it for you. If, for example, you want the path to be different to the name of the submodule. If you type git status after adding a submodule, uh, then you'll see you also have a new file, which is just the name of the submodule. Um, git considers this as a commit object rather than a directory or a file, um, and it will update. So say you update the submodule, it will treat it as a sort of commit diff, uh, which is quite interesting. It won't track all of the changes from the submodule because that's the point of submodules. Um, if you want to update the submodule, you can just cd, um, cd to it and fetch and merge or pull or whatever, or you can type git submodule update remote and it will do it. It will update all the submodules for you. 
Um, and you can see an explanation of the changes this made, and it will print out all the commit names, which is quite handy. Um, when you clone a repo that has some modules in it, the folders appear empty to start with, but you can automatically fetch them if you want using the recur submodules option. Three. Okay, uh, I gave a hint that I was going to be talking about this uh, a little bit earlier, uh, but git bundle. Um, so GitHub sometimes goes down, so does GitLab, happens, you know, Virgin Media Broadband is down about half the time. How can you share Git information to other people without HTTP or SSH? Uh, well, uh, the way that people used to send things to each other uh, over email or via USB stick still work. Uh, and Git bundle is a way of packaging commit history into a single file so that you can actually use that. Um, so in some cases as well, you can treat it basically as a remote and fetch and merge from the file, although uh, there are some caveats to that. Uh, it also comes with a verify tool so you can check the file contains everything you need and that you can apply them. Um, so uh, to bundle a series of commits together, you use git bundle create, um, and you can use um, revision selection to decide how many commits you're going to bundle up. The first one will just bundle up all of master. Uh, the second one will bundle up all commits in the last 10 days. The third one will bundle up the last 12 commits, and the bottom one will use a commit range. Um, so when you've run your git bundle over via a USB to the person that you actually want to install the thing, you can use git bundle verify um, to check whether you can apply it immediately. And it's going to check two things for you. The first thing it's going to check is that the bundle is a valid file. Um, and the second thing that it's going to check is that you have the prerequisite commits. So it's going to package a series of commits onto this bundle, and it's also going to um, remember what the commits before that series of commits were uh, so that it knows that it's got the right prerequisite when you when you take it over. Um, so the thing on the left is what it will say if everything's fine and dandy, um, and the thing on the right is what it will say if you don't have a prerequisite. So that's, that's how that works. And it's very useful um, if for some reason GitHub or GitLab are down, but you can still access another person via USB. Um, Oh yeah, so uh, you can fetch commits from a bundle. Uh, sometimes Git will create a remote for you and, tr and sort of treat it as a remote. Uh, I don't totally understand how this works myself. Uh, I haven't had to use this particular thing and during the research I did for this talk I couldn't quite figure out an answer. Um, but I think it only happens when you bundle an entire repo or branch. Four. Okay, um, so now we're getting on to things that I would call useful. Um, the first one of these is diffing Microsoft Word documents. So Microsoft Word is kind of bad, but people do use it, and sometimes people want to put it in version control. Uh, the thing is, it's not really a plain text file format, and Git treats it as a binary file. We can actually diff them using uh, Git attributes. So Git still treats them as binary, but will show us meaningful diffs if we uh, use this little workaround. So in a Git attributes file, you can set a pattern and then set diff equals and then a name of a, a diff filter. Um, and let's say we, we make a binary somewhere on our path um, that is just a Perl script that uh, converts a document to a text file. Um, if we then uh, use diff.word.textconv, which is the name of uh, text conversion, essentially, from a binary format to a text format, um, this is what uh, this is the name for that in Git. So we set this in the settings. So um, we set diff, and then the diff, uh, the, the word in that series of dots is the name of the thing that we're, the name of our filter, and then textconv is the, the filter itself. And then we set it to be this script, then it will automatically apply that when we use diff. As I say, Git still treats them as binary on the back end, but this can be quite useful for viewing what's actually changed. Um, so you can use this as well to diff images by exif data, uh, or PowerPoints by content if you can find a good converter. Oh, I should probably mention, uh, doctortxt.pl is actually a thing. You can uh, find that and use that as an example. Uh, it's a Perl script, you just Google it, it'll be there. Uh, even PDFs sometimes, if you've got a good way of extracting text from a PDF. Um, okay, right, now we're on to useful ones. Um, so, Cinder actually used this in his talk um, that was before mine, git grep, and it is really, really handy. Um, a lot of the functionality is the same as actual grep, but there are some interesting Git, uh, Git specific options as well. Uh, it has some really cool options, and, and Cinder actually showcased one of them, which is great. So uh, here are just four basic ways that you can use Git grep. You can use Git grep to search for a string, and it will show you the result. Or it, it, sorry, it'll show you the file, and then a colon, and then the lines that contain them. Um, Git grep uh, dash n will also show you the line number, um, and personally, I have no idea why that isn't the default because that's just very useful. Um, Git grep dash p 
uh, will show you will attempt to show you the enclosing function. So it'll have um, hello world hs equals, and then um, the function well, it seems to think that the type signature is what I want there. Um, and git grep dash c will count it in the same way that grep will. Um, there are some really good options here. So double dash text conv, if you remember what I just said about how to diff Microsoft Word documents, it honors that those filter settings. So if you use di um, if you use git grep on a docx file um, with one of those filters enabled, it will run it through the filter first, which is really, really useful, right? If you're looking for something in a docx file. Um, you can change the regex type. That's fairly standard. Dash O will actually open all files with matches in a, f a program of your choosing. Um, you have to write it right after the option. So um, I've given you an example there, dash O vim or something like that. Uh, you can parse double dash context, which I think is something that Sinjo was probably doing uh, at some point during the talk because he managed to get the surrounding bit of uh, surrounding few lines. It shows you some surrounding lines of context. Uh, and you can also restrict the paths that get grep searches. It's really useful. What it isn't quite so useful for is searching history. Uh, for this, git log is better. Um, so git log dash l um, will let you pass either a function name or a range, and it will show you all of the commits where that's changed. Um, git log dash s will... Um, it tracks changes to the number of occurrences of the search term. So for example, the first commit that introduced uh, the regex higher, it will... Um, it will uh, it will show you that commit, and if the number of highest in the document change, it'll also show you what commits those were as well. Right, six, uh, smudging and cleaning. I really like these, uh, and I use these a bunch uh, for various things. So there are more uses for get attributes than just diffing doc files. We can also use them to automatically format files when we commit them and hide secrets. Um, so it's like another filter that we defined. So we had that sort of diff filter earlier on, but these ones are just called filters. Um, and there are two types of filters, clean and smudge. Clean filters run on files when they're staged. The way I like to remember this is you you clean something when you're about to present it to someone else. So when you're about to put it into the into the Git repository, you should clean them, and otherwise you should smudge them when you need the information. Um, or yeah, uh, there are more uses than these two, by the way. But I'm only going to focus on these two for quick examples. Um, so here is how you would do it for linting. So again, in the Git attributes file, you can create a rule that says all Haskell files will set a fin uh, will set a filter, um, and we're going to call it lint. Um, and then in, in git config somewhere, you can go filter.lint.clean, and then you can set the name of a linter, uh, or Molu is a Haskell linter. Uh, git config um, filter.lint.smudge, and we can just use cat, for example. We don't actually have to uh, set the smudge filter, but I'm just showing you what, what an example would look like. And obviously cat doesn't change any of the input. So what this will do is whenever we stage a Haskell file, it will lint it for us. Uh, and whenever, whenever we check it out, it will do nothing, which is really, really handy if you want automatic linting in some way. We can also use it to hide secrets. So say we want uh, config.json to have a, a filter on it so that we don't accidentally commit secrets. Well, if we have a filter called move secrets, um, then we can just run sed on the filter to remove the secret and replace it with some sort of placeholder. Um, and we can set a smudge filter to replace that same placeholder with a secret, uh, which means the secret will stay locally and it will not be committed, which is good because you should not commit secrets. Uh, yeah, and obviously be really careful with credentials. It, it goes without saying, but be very careful with credentials. It's kind of dangerous. So make sure you do these right. Um, okay, and the final thing I want to talk about in the one and a half minutes that I have left is hooks. Um, hooks are, I would call them niche, but they are useful, which is why they're at the end of this talk. Uh, hooks help you avoid mistakes or automate boring, boring tasks. Essentially, those are the two main uses for them. Um, you can use them for CI, CD. You can use, uh, you can check that commits don't break builds. Uh, you can automatically update submodules on every commit if you want to do that, although that can be a bit risky. Um, so hooks are stored in a subdirectory of .git. They're named exactly the same as the thing that triggers them with no extension. So um, if you've got a Perl script, you've got to omit the extension and just use a shebang or something like that. Uh, for example, the post commit hook is at .git slash hook slash post commit. It's just a file. You've got to give it executable permissions. Uh, when you run git in it, git actually puts a load of examples in .git slash hooks. Um, and they're all appended with samples, so they won't run. But they contain um, really useful examples of how you can use hooks to make your life a bit easier. Um, there are four really important hooks to do with commits, and they all run at slightly different times. Um, uh, in, in the first three of them as well, you can abort the commit um, by exiting with a non-zero exit code. So you can use that to check that you're not doing anything dangerous. Um, for, or for, for example, check that the build doesn't break. So you can run tests, and if the test exit on zero, then you can um, abort the commit. Um, and you can do things with changing the templates of commit messages as well. It's all very useful. I'll leave them in the slide, but I won't read the slide out because I'll, I'll give you the slides later. 
Um, there are other hooks to bear in mind as well, um, although these are often a little less useful. There are also some server-side hooks, and GitHub lets you write them in GitHub Enterprise. And I, re- I remember doing that um, during an internship I was at once. Um, but uh, I'm not sure whether you can do it in regular GitHub. But if you have a Git server that you control, you can also you can also use them there. Um, a couple of things to bear in mind with hooks. Note what input you're given. So the example scripts that Give gives you uh, just demonstrate how to use the input you're given well. And be careful about the working directory, because some of the hooks are a bit inconsistent as to what the working directory is considered as. Um, and um, some of them set... Uh, dollar git dear uh, and some of them don't so you just got to make sure that you know where you are and make sure to test them thoroughly but aside from that they're a really really useful feature that amazingly was 15 minutes um thank you very much for listening i'm going to put the the sources for the talk on the screen uh, a lot of a lot of stuff was taken from the git book especially when i was checking how a few things worked uh, git man pages as well um there were some good examples about smudge and clean on this blog post uh, and also there were oh yes uh, the, the blog post from git hooks is about uh, how the working directory is set on different um git hooks as uh, by default so that is the end of my talk uh do you want me to leave recording on during questions i suppose we can always crop it out if we need to at the end uh, but yeah happy to take questions now. uh cool yeah. anyone got any questions I, I, that was a lot of information very quickly. Uh, I cannot explain git merge slash s octopus. Um, I, I can't. That's that's one thing about git that I cannot explain. I haven't looked into that very well. Um, what would the eighth most niche git feature have been? Huh. That's interesting. So there's git replace. Um, because git, re- git so git replace uh, is an instruction to git that lets you treat a file as another file always um and the main reason that didn't make this talk is because i didn't really understand totally how it worked uh what's my favorite non-niche feature um i mean hooks aren't that niche so if you'll let me look use one of the same one from the talk i'll, I'll take i'll take hook again oh no bisect is really good actually bisect is really good yeah actually you know i just need to put that in chat get bisect is quite useful also get blame I quite like that as well. Bisect sort of lets you find um, where something was introduced by search. Get, oh yeah, get reflog um, is a niche feature that would have made this talk if this talk was three hours long. seeing people typing no one's typing okay that's cool um if there are no more questions uh thank you very much i look forward to the karaoke <laughs>